Today we're going to look at an important theorem that uses a functional equation to classify a very important complex valued function. And in particular, that complex valued function generalizes something you learn about in grade school known as the factorial. And so, well, you might know where we're going here. That means we're going to classify a functional equation that defines the gamma function. And this take is based on a paper from the American Mathematical Monthly in 1996. But first we need a couple of definitions. So we say a function f from d to c is holomorphic if, well, the complex derivative of f exists for all z inside of d. And sometimes we would say that uh, this is holomorphic on a domain D. And just to be very clear here, D is a subset of complex numbers. Then if that D is all complex numbers, in other words, it's holomorphic on the entire complex plane, then this function is called entire. And you might say, well, what's the big deal about being differentiable or having the derivative exist? In the real numbers, well, that doesn't mean the second derivative exists, and that doesn't actually give you a ton of power. But in the complex world, the complex derivative or complex differentiation is actually a very, very powerful tool or a very, very powerful result. And actually, I did a previous video on that if you'd like to check it out. And then uh, furthermore, just for this video, we're going to set A equal to the right half plane. In other words, it's all complex numbers where the real part is positive. So that does not include the imaginary axis, but everything to the right of the imaginary axis. So you can't really tell here, but that's a dotted line along the imaginary axis. Okay, so let's start with the following proposition. And so if f, which goes from a to complex numbers, is holomorphic, and it satisfies the following functional equation, f of z plus 1 equals z times f of z, then there is a holomorphic extension of f, which we'll call f hat, and it doesn't go from the entire complex plane, it goes from the complex plane minus non-positive integers. So that's going to be every complex number except for like 0, negative 1, negative 2, so on and so forth. And, well, what rules does it satisfy? Well, it's going to satisfy the original functional equation. And then when we restrict it to the values of a, well, it'll just be our original function. That's what makes this an extension of our original function. Furthermore, the residue of this function at the poles, in other words, at the non-positive integers, is equal to negative 1 to the n times f of 1 over n factorial. And that f of 1 tells us that, well, if f of 1 is 0, then all of those residues equal 0. And from that, it'll follow that this is entire. Okay, let's move on to our proof, which is really a construction type proof. We're going to construct this function f hat. So let's take some number z, which comes from the complex numbers minus the set of non-positive integers. So in other words, that's everything, like I said before, except for 0, negative 1, negative 2, so on and so forth. And then we'll also let n, which is a natural number, and here we're going to include 0. I'll put union 0 here, but if you want to say that 0 is a natural number, that's also okay. And we're going to let this n be the smallest number such that we have z plus n plus 1 is inside of a. And we'll actually set this z plus n plus 1 equal to something that we'll call z hat. And let's talk about how this is working over here. So we're going to take z, which is a complex number, so that could be anywhere in the complex plane. Maybe it's over here, for instance. And then, well, we'll add n plus 1 to it until we end up in this set A, which I've like shaded in green. So I think that's pretty clear how that works. 
And notice that if we're inside of A, then N is equal to zero. So let's point that out over here. So if Z is inside of A, then that means that N is equal to zero. Okay, but now how are we gonna define our function F hat? So let's do that here. We'll define f hat of z to be equal to f of z hat. So we've got a way to calculate f of z hat, and that's because z hat is inside of a, and a is the domain of f. And then we're gonna divide that by z times z plus one times z plus two, all the way up to z plus n. Okay, great. And now, like I said, we need to show that these match on A. That'll make this an extension like I said before. So let's maybe note that here. So we'll take Z inside of A, which means N is equal to zero, which means that Z hat is equal to Z plus one. But now let's calculate F hat of Z in this case which is gonna be f of z hat, which is f of z plus one over z. But now we can apply this functional equation up here to f of z plus one to write it as z times f of z. So here we have z times f of z over z, that simply gives us f of z. So yes, those do match on our set A, which is good. So that makes this f hat a true extension of our function f. Okay, now we just need to calculate the residue. So let's do that here. So the residue at z equals minus n, where here n is gonna be a natural number, maybe including zero. So if it's minus n, it could be minus zero, which is zero, minus one, minus two, so on and so forth, of f hat of z. But let's recall how to take that residue. That'll be the limit as z goes to minus n of, let's see, z plus n times f hat of z. And you might say, well, that's not the definition for the residue, but that's a known formula for the residue in the case that you have a pole of order one, and you do have a pole of order one here. So I won't check that, maybe that's a bit of a homework exercise. Okay, so now let's replace f hat with its definition here. So here we're going to have the limit as z goes to minus n of, so let's see, we'll have f of z hat, so that's going to be f of z plus n plus 1 over z times z plus 1 all the way up to z plus n, but then we need to multiply by this z plus n. So we get some obvious cancellation, this z plus n and this z plus n cancel. And I guess I should say, well, we get that this is a first order pole because after that cancellation, we have a function that's holomorphic at z equals minus n based off the fact that z evaluated it, uh, or f evaluated at z plus n plus one is holomorphic there. And then, well, the denominator is as well. So that's briefly and maybe very vaguely why that is holomorphic or why this thing has a pole of order one. Okay, so now we can plug in minus n and that'll leave us with f of one in the numerator and in the denominator we'll have minus n, minus n plus one all the way up to Let's see, it'll be minus one. That'll be the last one we have there. But now we can factor all those minus ones out. There are n such minus ones. So we have minus one to the n um, times f of one. And after factoring out all those minus ones, we're left with n factorial. But that's exactly where we needed to end up. Okay, so now that we have this proposition, we're ready to do our main result. So let's suppose we've got a holomorphic function on A called capital F, and then it satisfies two conditions. 
So the first condition is that functional equation that we're saying maybe defines f to be our special function, the gamma function. In other words, f of z plus one equals z times f of z. And that's gonna be for all z inside of a, where we've been using the a before. Next up, we're gonna assume that f of z is bounded on s. And s is gonna be the vertical strip between the place where the real part of z is one and where it is two, including one, but not two. So I've sketched that strip over here. Then the result is that f of z is equal to f of one, whatever that is, times gamma of z. So in other words, it's a multiple, a constant multiple of the gamma function. So let's just take a step back here. If our function satisfies this functional equation and some other things, but this functional equation is the most important thing, then it's essentially the gamma function up to a constant. So we could think that this functional equation is somehow defining the gamma function. And before we go into the proof, let's recall a couple of facts about the gamma function, which are pretty easy to prove. And that is the gamma function satisfies that functional equation. That's a standard exercise in like an integral calculus class where you use integration by parts. And furthermore, gamma is bounded on S. That's a little bit trickier, but not too bad. Okay, so let's get to the proof. So let's set f of z, so lowercase f of z, equal to capital F of z minus f of one, capital F of one, times gamma of z. So if we can show that this function is identically zero, well then we're good to go just by moving some things around here. Okay. So let's quickly note that f of z plus one, lowercase f of z plus one, is z times lowercase f of z. Also, let's notice that f evaluated at one is equal to zero. That's just by our construction here. I think that's pretty clear. Okay, and then let's note that the corresponding f hat is entire. And that's because all of those residues, in other words, the residue at z equals minus n of f hat of z is equal to zero. All of those residues is equal to zero. And then they also all had first order poles. So only having first order poles and the residues being zero, or I guess I should say at most first order poles, means that in fact, we don't have any poles, which means it is an entire function. It's holomorphic on the whole complex plane. Okay, now we're gonna define an accessory function, which I'll call S of Z. Well, they called it S of Z in this paper as well. And that's gonna be F hat of Z times F hat of one minus Z. And let's note that this function is also entire. And that's, well, because it's a product of two entire functions. If f hat of z is entire, then f hat of one minus z is also entire. And then let's also notice it is bounded. Well, bounded on s, I should say. Well, that's because our original capital F function is bounded on s, and our gamma function is also bounded on s but our lowercase f is made up of our uppercase f and our gamma, and f hat matches lowercase f on s on this strip, because we're inside of a here, which means it's bounded on s. Okay, now let's make the following observation, which will take us almost all of the way home. And that is if we take f or s of s plus one, that'll be f hat of s plus one times f hat of minus z. Sorry, I should say s of z plus one. So that is f hat of z plus one and f hat of minus z just by composing z plus one into the definition of s there. But now we'll apply the functional equation satisfied by f hat, which is the same as the functional equation satisfied by f, given that one is an extension of the other. 
So that's going to give us z times f hat of z. So that's for our f hat of z plus 1. And then it'll give us minus f hat of um, <clears throat> 1 minus z over z. That'll be for our f of minus z. Again, we're just using that functional equation two times. But notice that that simplifies the z's pretty clearly cancel, and we're left with minus f hat of z times f hat of 1 minus z, but that's exactly equal to minus s of z. So notice s of z plus 1 is equal to minus s of z. Oh, but what does that mean? That means that s of z plus 1 is also bounded on s. But that means that s of z minus 1 is also bounded on s. But that allows us to take the place that s is bounded and shift it. So one way we'll shift it right one unit and then right another unit. We could also shift it left, left, left. But after shifting those strips really any number of times to the right that we want and any number of times to the left that we want, what we'll have is that s of z is bounded on all of the complex plane. That's what we get after, like I said, shifting that strip around. Oh, but something really special is happening here. We have an entire function. Let's recall that our function s of z is entire and we just showed that it's bounded on all complex numbers or on the whole complex plane. But being bounded on complex plane and being entire by Louisville's theorem tells us that f s of z, I should say, is a constant function. But if it's equal to a constant function, well, it could be just equal to any of its values. So we might as well set it equal to s of 1 because it's easy to calculate s of 1, it's equal to 0. So let's re reiterate, this was an entire function, it was bounded by Louisville's theorem, that means it's a constant function. If it's a constant function, then s of z is equal to s of 1, that's one of its values. s of 1 is equal to 0 just by our construction right here. Oh, but if s of z is equal to 0, using this definition of s of z right here, that tells us that f hat of z is also equal to 0. But if f hat is equal to 0, that means our underlying function f of z is also equal to 0, because f hat is an extension of f. But notice if lowercase f is equal to 0, moving things around, and solving for capital F, we get exactly what we want here. So we have our function capital F is equal to a constant multiple of the gamma function as needed, showing us that yes, well this with some other minor hypotheses defines the gamma function. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.